I've always been an insomniac. Eventually I gave up on having regular sleep, but in time I got to the root cause of the issue. This allowed me to finally do what it takes to sleep like a baby without struggling for hours every night. Now I can sleep just about any time and place I want to. Uh, uh, what? Give those glasses to the bailiff. All right. And those. Oh. The most common advice you'll hear for insomnia is to take some melatonin. This can help somewhat, and it did help me a bit, but I tended to oversleep if I took it and I would be drowsy in the morning. Even so, I still didn't get to sleep very easily. Melatonin is a hormone produced in the pineal gland that generally only gets produced in total darkness. It has many effects in the body, and the more we go forward, the more we learn about it. But one of the most important things it does is to help you get to sleep. Light pollution, like a television or an aquarium with lights on, can really cut into your sleep quality for this reason. I found that while I don't really like taking melatonin that much, putting my lights on a timer helped quite a bit with getting to sleep better, and it didn't leave me drowsy in the morning. I also tried the sleeping pill Ambien, but that has sort of the opposite effect. Instead of having trouble waking up, I would sleep really hard for about 5 hours, then I would bolt awake and be totally unable to sleep. Ambien is also associated with greatly increased all-cause mortality, so you probably shouldn't be taking it unless you absolutely have to. What really causes it though? What wakes you up and puts you to sleep? While this is a complicated question, I finally realized over time it is cortisol dysregulation that causes most sleep issues. When you wake up in the morning, this is due to the dawn effect. This is a morning spike in cortisol that increases the sugar in your bloodstream and also the adrenaline, and this signals the brain that it's time to wake up and start your day. This is why you don't really need to eat breakfast in the morning. You have plenty of energy provided to make it to noon. The best part is that since all blood sugar is regulated by the liver, if you have any fat in your liver, this is the, what the liver uses to make the glucose in your blood. So the last thing you want to do at this point is eat carbs early in the morning, which just shoves it all right back into the liver using insulin. You may think that three meals a day has always been the standard, but it was only in the Victorian era that three meals a day became the norm because that's when food started to become an industrialized commodity that you could just whip out of a box or bag at any time. Even so, the working people were the only ones who ate a breakfast as we think of it. The rich would eat two meals a day and both of them were surprisingly close together towards the middle of the day at noon and five o'clock. What made it breakfast was not the time of day specifically, but rather that it was simply the first meal of the day. You were breaking your fast. And really the only difference with these big breakfasts and at dinner was the food that was being served and how it was being served. Usually you weren't at a big dinner table and everything was served a la fourchette or simply with a fork. No need to cut anything, everything was kind of finger foods. After a man's midday breakfast, he then makes a tour of the town for about four hours until five o'clock, which is the dinner hour. At nine o'clock in the evening, he meets his friends in a tavern or a club, and there the night is passed in play and drink. That is precisely how the day is spent. In Victorian times, the working people ate a carb-rich meal before starting their grueling 12 to 14 hour working day while the better off ate some kippers, eels, and other low-carb finger foods for their first meal, which was around noon. This reflects the diet we see before modern industrialized times with big cities. The truly rich also had some salad and fruit like raisins, but these were very expensive before refrigeration and cheap transport, so very few could afford to eat this way, and in the medieval times it was only kings and the very richest people who could afford sugar. 
When you eat all the time, especially carb-rich meals, your insulin creeps up slowly over time. This increases your cortisol over time because when insulin drives your blood sugar down, cortisol responds by increasing and by creating more sugar, which is the main thing that it does. This leads to insulin resistance over time. And the more insulin resistant you are, the more blood sugar is needed by cells to function. It also takes more insulin to lower the blood sugar. This leads to a vicious cycle over time where cortisol, insulin, and blood sugar all go up and up. You also find it harder and harder to go for long periods without eating carbs because even though blood sugar is high in the blood, you have so much insulin resistance that your cells can't go for very long without having it at higher levels. Jian would constantly feel hungrier and hungrier. Noodles are made of carbohydrates, of which the more one eats, the hungrier they can get. Despite trying to be frugal with money, he started eating pounds of ramen every day because it was all that he had. Four pounds a day, 30 days a month, over 100 pounds every month. And the more he ate, the hungrier he got. All of this has an extremely bad effect on your sleeping ability. When cortisol is up, blood sugar and adrenaline are also high, and this makes it very difficult to sleep. Once you do get to sleep, you may wake up in the middle of the night and be unable to get back to sleep, or else you'll sleep so hard you're in danger of oversleeping. This is also highly catabolic and leads to the loss of muscle over time, and even decreases the number of neurons in the brain. Thankfully, there are ways to deal with this. Red light therapy is very relaxing, and I have found that some red light on my forehead or on my back is going to help a great deal with getting to sleep. This can also help decalcify your pineal gland over time, and this is where melatonin is generated. This will help get rid of spikes in your blood also, whether they're natural or artificial in origin, and any other type of plaque that may be in your organs or your arteries. Phototherapy not only helps you to get to sleep faster, but also gives you much more vivid dreams and when you wake up you'll feel much more refreshed. You also don't have to get the light to the exactly right spot on your body to affect the cells because the cells communicate with each other and they even trade mitochondria. So these three mechanisms, the mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase, the light heat gated ion channels and the molecular rotor all have roughly the same outcomes. Not the same, but similar outcomes. Um, so this was an interesting discovery that didn't happen that long ago. There's a, a press release in January this year where they discovered that normal blood contains circulating cell-free respiratory competent mitochondria. And that said, does the blood we thought we to know so well contain elements that have been undetectable until now? Which is quite interesting how they managed to miss them over hundreds of years. But the idea is that normal blood contains these cell-free mitochondria that, and we know that mitochondria are easily activated by light. So the idea is this explains why you can shine light on one part of the body and it can have effects all over the body, a systemic effect or uh, you know, action at a distance, if you will. Um, nevertheless, the light does have to get in the body and only certain wavelengths can penetrate into tissue. And you see here the so-called tissue optical window between 600 and 1200 nanometers, showing that these are the wavelengths that can get in. Um, Red light and near infrared, also called phototherapy or photobiomodulation, or many other names, has an endless array of benefits from aiding sleep to releasing stem cells. But I think the ability to relax blood vessels and increase mitochondrial function are the ones that have the most effect. And this is gonna drive the other effects. Just 10 minutes of red light on your face or forehead before bed should help a great deal with getting to sleep. 
I have heard it claimed many times that viewing red light in the morning does special things to your circadian rhythm, but in my experience the best results come from using these devices right before the bed, and though red light does increase mitochondrial function, I don't think any of these claims are based on actual science and that the red light timing in the morning doesn't really come from real experimental data, just from supposition and speculation. Anaconda malt liquor gives you <laughs> What is another word for Richard? <laughs> another thing that helps some people is glycine. I usually take glycine and most other supplements about an hour after meals, but you can also take it on its own just before bedtime to help with sleep. Glycine can directly affect the GABA receptors in the brain to cause deep relaxation. Just be aware this doesn't work well for everyone. Some people claim they have the opposite effect and they get anxious when taking a large amount of glycine. So start slowly and work your way up. I take 6 grams of glycine a day, but 1 gram is probably a good starting place, or even less. Glycine also has an endless list of other benefits. It will help the body deal with sleep apnea, low blood oxygen, stroke, and even schizophrenia and other very serious mental illnesses. For the handicapped. I am handicapped. I'm psychotic. These can help a lot, and you can start them right away, and they don't really cost much money. But in the long term, you really need to address the root cause of the problem. The best way to do this is some extended fasting and a low-carb diet. This breaks the up-and-down yo-yo cycle between insulin and cortisol, which wreaks havoc on your sleeping ability over time. When you fast, the liver uses any damaging liver fat inside itself, because it needs this to create glucose so your blood sugar remains stable and this is one of the main jobs of the liver. This is critical because the liver is really the driver of metabolic health in the body and this is the most important organ when it comes to autophagy and metabolic health. Now the liver. The liver I believe is one of the unsung heroes or unappreciated heroes when it comes to um, uh, human metabolism. And there are two processes I want to highlight, and that is the liver's ability to both make lipid and to make glycogen, the storage form of glucose. So it's uh, the liver's one of the one of the tricks the liver has to once once insul, uh, glucose has been pulled in, it will um, store it. So it's just a way to help um, buffer the glucose levels in the blood. If glucose levels are high, the liver can pull in some of that more than what it needs for its own energy demands. And then when glucose goes low, the liver can break that glycogen down and share it with the blood or with the body. So that's the de definitions there, the production of fat and the production of, of glycogen. Insulin, of course, as it has its hand in so many things, also has its hand in these events as well. In particular, it stimulates both of them. Insulin will both st stimulate the production of lipid and the production of glycogen. With insulin resistance in the liver, there's an interesting phenomenon, and it is reflective of the fact that insulin resistance is not just a global effect within the cell. It is not that every event that insulin used to do is not happening. And, and let me get into that, to, just to make that clear. When the liver is insulin resistant, lipogenesis is still activated when insulin comes knocking at the door, so to speak, when insulin binds its insulin receptor. So to make that clear, even if the liver is insulin resistant, insulin can still stimulate lipogenesis. In contrast, <clears throat> in the insulin resistant liver, insulin is less able to make glycogen. So it's less able to tell the liver to store glucose. And this loss of stimulating glycogenesis means we have a reduction. We actually end up insulin loses its ability to prevent the breakdown of glycogen. So now we have glycogenolysis. This event is disrupted in insulin resistance. And so now we have a liver that is supposed to be holding on to glucose. It's actually letting it go, but it's not supposed to. Remember, that's the pathology here. Insulin is trying to stimulate or it ought to be stimulating glucose uptake and storage. It's not working anymore. So the liver doesn't get the signal not to break down glycogen 
And so it does. It's not being inhibited, the glycogenolysis. And this, of course, drives up blood glucose levels. So once again, if we look at this paradigm of the progression towards full-blown type 2 diabetes, with the liver being insulin resistant, we've pushed that a little further down the road. The patient has progressed, progressed a little further towards full-blown type 2 diabetes. So they're getting this mounting hyperglycemia. Fasting also dramatically reduces your insulin levels, which allows fat to come out of the fat cells and reduces insulin resistance. While your cortisol generally goes up while fasting, lowered insulin means that when you break the fast, your cortisol will also go down dramatically. This is why people who have trouble sleeping while fasting will typically get over it in time. Eventually, both your cortisol and insulin will be low most of the time, and your liver will finally stop excessively shooting out glucose and signaling the brain to shoot out adrenaline into your bloodstream, and that's what causes the insomnia in the first place. Eating further away from nighttime will also help, but for some people with this issue, a small snack right before bed, like some berries or warm milk, could temporarily ease the way into sleep until you get your metabolic issues in check. Fasting has been shown experimentally to improve your circadian rhythm over time, and that's because it fixes these issues with cortisol and insulin. This, along with lowering carbs in your diet, is the ultimate solution to these issues. If you're older, you will probably also find yourself able to sleep for longer, too. I used to constantly wake up at 4 a.m., and then I'd just be stuck and unable to get back to sleep, regardless of what I did or took. Or I would get back to sleep just as the alarm rang. While I've tried many things for sleep, most of them were a bust for me. What really helped me were some lifestyle changes that cost little or nothing, such as fasting, phototherapy, and lowering carbs. Cheap aminos like glycine can also help a great deal for many people, while expensive supplements like magnesium don't seem to really do all that much, though you could also try some magnesium glycinate or threonate, a small amount of, say, 250 milligrams could be useful for activating GABA receptors in some people. Unfortunately, most of the other supplements either just don't really work well or they have unpleasant side effects. One of the side effects of taking a big supplement stack for insomnia is money deficiency. I don't know about you, but I don't like giving away my money for nothing. Oh, I, I like money. I can't believe you like money too. We should hang out.